in the description box the full playlist of the Super 4 series that I've been doing for a while now. Detailing their struggles, their rise to fame, the boom period of the super fights in the 80s, from the amateurs to the pros. So let's go. The super fights had the press going crazy. They were trying to get interviews with anybody they could from both parties. Bob Arum and his publicist found themselves arranging press conferences for Dundee and the Petronellis. They went back and forth quite a bit, the Petronellis and Dundee. But to demonstrate there were no hard feelings, Pascal Petronelli and Angelo agreed to meet for dinner after the fight, with the loser picking up the tab and the winner choosing the menu. Dundee's choice was linguine with clam sauce, Petronelli's pasta e fagolio, spaghetti and meatballs. Believe it or not, Al Bernstein took to the mic, but not to commentate, although he did that too, but he was doing a bit of crooning. The ESPN commentator, who would also work the closed circuit telecast of the super fight, he opened up to rave reviews as a headline act in Caesars, the festival of jazz where he played the Olympia Lounge, the same venue in which Pat McGuigan had performed 10 months earlier on the weekend of his son's ill-fated Las Vegas debut. Caesars was the epicenter of the boxing world that weekend. And a casino scheduled Friday and Saturday cards leading up to Hagler Leonard on Monday night. Iron Barkley, he won an unpopular decision over Jorge Amparo of the Dominican Republic. Amparo had held the WBC youth title. Barkley won an unpopular decision, receiving a nasty gash over his left eye that bled over the last half of the fight. Terry Crystal, the doctor who had treated Hagler in Palm Springs, might as well have used his scalpel on his opponent, Sam Houston, opening up four gashes on his opponent's face before Davy Pearl stopped it in the fourth round. This would be Crystal's last win on the ESPN undercard. Later that year, he lost for the first time, dropping a decision to Dave Tiberi in Atlantic City. He retired with a record of 13 wins, one loss, one draw, and devoted himself to medicine after. All in Norris, he knocked out Eddie Richardson in two, on the ESPN card. On Saturday afternoon, CBS televised a live card headlined by Donald Curry and Carlos Santos, a junior middleweight clash between a pair of former champions. Curry won when Carlos Padilla disqualified Santos for repeated headbutts in the fifth round. The network also carried a one hour sports Saturday special dedicated to Hagler and Leonard with John Madden and Gil Clancy analysing Monday night's matchup. Although CBS had no direct involvement with the Hagler Leonard telecast, its usual boxing broadcast team of Tim Ryan and Gil Clancy would man the microphones for the live closed circuit telecast. HBO paid $3 million for up to three replays, while ABC, which had purchased the rights to the delayed, delayed broadcast, would also have a crew at ringside. The heightened security measures surrounding Hagler's preparation directly precipitated the goofy episode that would be recalled in Boston newspapers' law as camera gates, where basically newspapers were fighting for the attention of Hagler's training camp, which he was keeping secret. The Boston Herald won out, and they managed to get a few photos with a bit of trickery, wheeling and dealing, but that led to animosity with the Boston Globe, and the Brockton Enterprise, who were also newspapers to where Marvin Hagler resided. Then at the final Hagler shakeout on Saturday night, someone at Toko's detected a clicking sound, and upon investigating discovered two cameras secretly mounted above the ring. The Petronelli's immediate assumption was that the cameras were part of an espionage mission orchestrated by Leonard's camp. The cameras were confiscated and the film immediately destroyed. Leonard's people insisted that they had nothing to do with the cloak and dagger operation. You sure Alan Funt didn't put those cameras in there? Laughed J.D. Brown. As it turned out, Leonard's camp's hands were indeed clean. The cameras had been installed by a Boston Globe photographer, Jimmy Wilson, in an apparent attempt to even the score for the Herald exclusive. Even as a tearful Wilson pleaded for the return of his cameras, Globe sports editor Vince Doria acknowledged his role as choreographer of the bungled subterfuge. 
It was just an effort to get our cameras in the gym, confessed Doria. Closing the workouts in the first place was ridiculous. If Dad had opened it up for 10 minutes on Wednesday, we could have all got the photos we needed. As embarrassing as it was for the globe, Jimmy Wilson eventually got his cameras back. The real victim turned out to be Angie Carlino, blaming Hagler's personal photographer for the subsequent developments. Pat Petronelli angrily ordered Caesar's official Rich Rose to revoke Carlino's ringside credential. Banished from the ringside's entourage, Angie, who had been with Hagler throughout his career, watched his final fight from the stands. A poll in one Las Vegas newspaper found that 60 of 70 journalists covering the fight favoured Hagler. One of them was Lennon's longtime HBO broadcast colleague Larry Merchant, who picked Hagler in nine. I wouldn't go onto an operating table if I knew the surgeon hadn't been practicing regularly for five years, said Merchant. In any highly skilled profession, it's impossible to maintain the same level of effectiveness when you've been away for that long. Pat Putnam, who at one point had agreed to collaborate on Leonard's autobiography, he agreed with Merchant. A man can't train in a tuxedo for five years and expect to beat the middleweight champion of the world, said Putnam. Hagler in three, unless he hurries. Hagler in four or five, said Bud Schulberg. I think he'll be able to force Leonard to fight, and if that happens, he's just too big and too strong for him. Every time I look at Leonard, said Dave Anderson from the New York Times, I keep thinking about Kevin Howard. Among the dissenters was Tom Cryan, who had flown from Dublin to cover the fight for the Irish Independent. I can't see Leonard even taking this fight unless he thought he had a good chance of winning it, said Cryan. I can't see either fighter knocking the other out. So I'm saying Leonard by decision. Michael Katz, who had moved from the Times to the New York Daily News, had also picked Leonard. In the Hearns fight, I saw that Marvin's legs were no longer there after the first round. And in the Mugabe fight, it was clear that his reflexes were fading fast, said Katz. He was taking shots he would have never been subjected to before. Katz had already written a piece for one of the London papers in which he picked Leonard. But as the fight drew near, the wolfman's resolve seemed to be wavering. When Larry Merchant heard I was waffling on my original pick, he suggested I write a column for the Daily News, revealing that I'd changed my mind, recalled the wolfman. He said it would be the only thing fight fans talked about in New York. He was right about that. I looked like a genius in England and a schmuck in my hometown. Hagler and Leonard shared three common opponents and reporters chased down each one of them in the days before the super fight. Sugar Ray said Marcus Geraldo, the Mexican middleweight who had gone the distance with both Hagler and Leonard, has got more class, more boxing ability, he's more refined. He picked Ray. There won't be a knockout because both are very experienced. Sugar Ray doesn't have enough punch to knock out Hagler, but he can win on points. He said Sugar is smarter and he's going to make Hagler look bad. Duran and Hearns were divided in their opinions. I fought both and I should know, said Duran. Leonard has no chance. Hearns was already on record picking Leonard. The layoff will affect Ray, but I think he'll be able to overcome it, said the hitman. I've seen how well he thinks in the ring. He's the better boxer. If he boxes, goes side to side and gets the head movement going, he wins. But if Ray's plan is to go toe to toe, I think it's a mistake. Tommy got it spot on. Undoubtedly, at the urging of some editor back in Boston, the Herald even solicited the opinion of former heavyweight champion Ivan Drago from Rocky, played by Dolph Lundgren. Citing the conventional wisdom, he liked Hagler. He said, I don't think Ray will move as much as people think he will. I think Leonard will stand there and try to go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, and eventually Hagler would just be too strong. Both corners had gone through some structural changes since each man last fought. Dave Jacobs had buried the hatchet and returned to the Leonard camp and would work together with Dundee and Janks Morton, while Golding had replaced Wainwright as Hagler's attorney. Tony Petronelli would take on the barrister's place Manning the spit bucket in the champion's corner. Back when I was fighting main events, he'd come into the arena with me, reminisced Petronelli. Instead of working for me, I work for Marv now. The younger Petronelli recalled for reporters that week back in 1978. He had nearly been matched up against Leonard in the Boston fight that Dickie Eklund wound up getting. He was a hot shot out of the Olympics. He would have beaten me. He was a great fighter and I was just a good one. Both Janks Morton 
and Jacobs disputed the version of events. No way did we ever look at Petronelli, said Morton. His name was never mentioned. Maybe we should have, added Jacobs. Eklund turned out to be a tough one, though. Dickie Eklund, for those who don't know and haven't seen the film, that's Mickey Ward's elder brother. The final press conference at Caesars Coliseum, a room double the size of the real Coliseum, Frank Del Appa brought Hagler and Leonard together for the first time since the previous 8th of December in San Francisco, just before Hagler jumped ship on the tour for good. Leonard seemed strangely subdued, responding to most questions with one-word answers. Hagler arrived wearing a legionnaire's chapeau, replete with side flaps, and kept his sunglasses on as he joked his way through the session. Is my hair okay? He asked at one point. And when someone asks what advice his trainers had imparted, Marvin replied, they tell me that once I climb through the ropes, I'm on my own. When Leonard was questioned about his toughest fight, he replied, Bruce Finch. Although he stopped Bruce in free, that was the fight in which he detached his retina. On Sunday, publicist Irving Rudd handed out to the assembled media the menu for the meal Leonard had ordered for his post weigh-in repast. Chicken smothered in gravy and onions, cream-styled corn, fresh greens on rice, cornbread, iced tea, and fruit cocktail. And what did Hagler plan to eat? Leonard said, making sure Irving didn't swerve the question. A crowd of 3,000 turned out on the morning of the super fight to watch Hagler and Leonard weigh in at the sports pavilion. Ring announcer Chuck Hall introduced the principals who never got within 10 feet of one another. To a mixture of cheers and boos, Leonard went first, taking off his sweatsuit top before he weighed in at 158. Hagler, who wore a t-shirt letter champion to the ceremony, removed the garment as well as the hefty gold chain he wore around his neck before he stepped on the scale. Marvin loses five pounds without his Mr. T starter kit, cracked Akbar Muhammad. Hagler's weight was announced as 158 and a half. Neither man appeared to acknowledge the other's presence. For Hagler, whose weight hasn't varied since his amateur days, it was business as usual. But Leonard's weight represented a career high. He was not only 40 pounds bigger than he had been for his first amateur fight, but weighed nearly 20 pounds more than when he made his pro debut against Louis Vega a decade earlier. All of that weight is natural, publicist Charlie Brockman pointed out to Frank Del Alpa. No weights. He worked out for a year, hitting the speed bag, really banging the heavy bag. Jumping rope, sparring, sit-ups. Look at his legs. I don't know about other guys, but Ray's legs are really solid. All I know about legs, Pat Petronelli responded, is that you can run fast forward and then backward. And our guy is ready to go forward. Shielding itself in advance from criticism, the Nevada State Athletic Commission trotted out a retinal specialist, Louis Angioletti, who attested to the soundness of Leonard's eyesight. I found him perfectly fit, said the doctor. Boxers have a greater risk by virtue of their profession, but Ray has no greater risk than any other boxer on the card before or after his fight. That's the bottom line. Associated press scribe Fast Eddie Schuler was moved to note that the commission probably told Leonard that if something happened to his eye, he could be a judge. At the pre-fight rules meeting, Dundee complained to the commission about the location of Hagler's protective cup. He wears his trunk so high because he wears the damn cup up around his ribs, said Dundee. I saw a photo in the New York Times magazine recently where Hagler was posing in a pair of shorts and it was the first time I'd ever seen Hagler's navel. I was beginning to wonder if he had one. Richard Steele, who had performed credibly in Hagler Hearns two years earlier, was named the referee with no objection from either side. The original panel of judges was to have comprised of Lou Filippo, Dave Moretti and Harry Gibbs, but the Petronelli is still seething over Hagler's treatment in London after the Minter fight seven years earlier objected to the Englishman's inclusion on the panel. We want a Mexican judge, demanded Pat Petronelli, and he got one. Gibbs, who two years earlier had worked Hagler Hearns without incident, 
was replaced by Jose Juan Jojo Guerrero. Gibbs didn't even stay for the fight. He packed up his bags and flew home to England, arriving just in time to watch Leonard and Hagler on television. Although it was voiced by his co-manager, the challenge to Gibbs appears to have had the full support of Hagler himself. I have nothing against English people, the champion explained, but you know, if you get bad food in a restaurant, you don't want to go back there no more. The capacity of the outdoor stadium at Caesars Palace was supposed to be 15,236, but the officially announced attendance would be 15,366 tickets, with a 700 top for ringside had long been sold out. Though 2,000 of the best seats were never offered to the public, the host casino held many back for his preferred gambling customers. Hagler and Leonard with such a hot ticket that some of the A-list celebrities had been consigned to the bleachers, but Caesars released a list of guests that included the usual suspects, Jack Nicholson, Gene Hackman, Tom Selleck, Billy Crystal, Bo Derrick, Dave Brenner, from the world of entertainment, you had Muhammad Ali, John McEnroe, Wilt Chamberlain. You had Timothy Hutton, Willie Nelson, Joan Collins, to Chevy Chase, Tony Danza, and the Pointer Sisters. Action on the bout was so heavy that Lou D'Amico, the sports book manager at Caesar, said no question. Leonard Hagler couldn't be outdone unless we built the stadium out back and then got them to play Super Bowl here. The Aladdin, a hostelry down the street formerly owned by Wayne Newton, reopened just three days before Hagler and Leonard, after having its gaming license revoked two years earlier. We didn't plan our reopening night around the fight, said Aladdin spokesperson Barbara Shimko, but we sure don't mind the windfall. By fight time, Hagler remained the favourite, but the odds had been slashed to 5-2, to two, when the unquestionably highlight of the undercard came during the televised bout between Lupe Aquino and Davy Moore. At the beginning of the second round, a round card girl who identified herself to Michael Globetti as Alicia Patch was negotiating her way into the ring between the ropes when she leaned too far forwards and one of her breasts flopped out of her top. The unintended nudity was greeted by considerably more applause than even Lupino or Moore had received. When she climbed through the ropes a round later, and her boobs didn't fall out. She was booed by the crowd. <laughs> oh dear. Boo! <laughs> Tell me I'm not embarrassed, Miss Patch, told Globetti. <laughs> Aaron said he was paying the round card girls $75 a piece for the night's work, but they got to sit in $700 seats. There was no indication that Moore was distracted by Alicia and a wardrobe malfunction. But the former champion was stopped by Aquino in the fifth. In the principal undercard bout that followed, Roldan bounced back from his loss to Hagler with an impressive ninth round TKO of James Kinchin. Two young New England boxers had performed earlier in supporting roles. Brian Powers, a welterweight fighting out of the Petronelli gym, outpointed Celio Oliver in a four-rounder, while 21-year-old Mickey Ward a junior welterweight from Lowell, whom Teddy Bremner was touting as the best New England prospect since Hagler, ripped open a gash above Kelly Coble's right eye with a left hook on the way to a fourth round TKO that raised Ward's record to 13-0. and Hagler was probably more confident of victory in the Leonard fight than he had been for any of his previous 12 defences, and nothing that happened over the 12 rounds the two men shared in the ring the night disabused him of that notion. He was in fact so dismissive of Leonard's threat that he allowed the fight to slip away from him. Twenty years later, an incautious man could walk into the wrong Boston saloon with just two words, Leonard won, and would almost guarantee himself an invitation to step outside. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Leonard understood the rules of the game that they were playing way better than Marvin did, and Marvin never did hit a home run. For reasons that have never been entirely clear, Hagler attempted to confuse Leonard by abandoning his southpaw attack to box out of an orthodox stance and stubbornly clung to that strategy, even after its futility had been demonstrated. Mike Katz pointed out that Hagler never adequately explained his decision to come out right-handed. Katz tried to explain it himself and he says, Marvin told me once that 
he not only wanted to be the best worker on the assembly line at the shoe factory and the best bricklayer at the Petronelli Brothers construction, but that in addition to being the best middleweight in the world as a southpaw, he wanted to be the best from the orthodox stance as well, recalled the Wolfman. I think he may have been trying to prove that against Ray. The result was that the champion lost each of the first four rounds on the scorecards of two judges, as well as on my official tally for the Boston Herald, as well as on the official tally for the Boston Herald. Calling the fight on the pay-per-view telecast, Gil Clancy prophetically told colleague Tim Ryan, if Hagler loses this fight because he gave away the first two rounds, he won't be able to live with himself. In the corner between rounds, Goody Petronelli could be heard directing Hagler to rough him up, although at this point, Leonard didn't have a mark on him. In the fourth, Leonard even embarrassed Hagler by winding up and throwing a double right-handed bolo punch, although the blow landed waist-high and afflicted no damage. The fight took a turn in the fifth, when Hagler erupted with a display of aggression. The intervention of the bell appeared to annoy Hagler. A look of disgust on his face, he gave Leonard a disdainful shove. Leonard recalled a few months later about that incident, I was definitely in trouble. But when he passed Hagler on his way back to the corner, he realised at that moment he doesn't even know I'm hurt. He doesn't know it. I knew I had him right there. The odd aspect of this epiphany was that the fifth round was the first round that Leonard lost. All three judges scored the fifth for Hagler. If I was Leonard, Gil Clancy suggested in the eighth round, I'd load up and try to nail Hagler now. Hagler is getting overconfident and he's gasping now too. But at this point, Leonard was not listening to the television analysts. He didn't even seem to be listening to Angelo Dundee. Ray is a smart fighter, maybe the smartest Dundee would later recall this interlude. He's such an intelligent guy that you had to assume in his corner he just knew what he was doing. After Marvin gave away the first six or seven rounds, I knew he was figuring he had to finish strong to win a decision, explained Leonard. In the ninth, Hagler once appeared to have Leonard in a world of trouble, but Ray rallied with a flurry at the end of the round. The timing of Leonard's flashy eruptions was hardly an accident. In anticipation of the possibility that many rounds might be there for the taking, Ollie Dunlap, manning a stopwatch in the corner, had been directed to alert Leonard when 30 seconds remained in the stanza. Hagler had won the middle rounds, or won them everywhere save on the scorecard of Jojo Guerrero. Although Hagler seemed to be landing the more telling blows, Leonard was landing more punches, and over the final third of the fight, Ray would play the master Toreador to Marvin's increasingly enraged bull. It was as if Leonard had an invisible jetpack on his back, and when he sensed immediate malevolent intentions on Hagler's part, it triggered some psychic button that whooshed him backwards out of harm's way. That was the plan, Sugar Ray would say later, to cross his wires, to frustrate him and make him mad. You look back at the fight and you'll see that Marvin rarely threw combinations, except when he had me on the ropes. He hardly ever put two punches together. He was totally out of sync. Indeed, as Hagler tried to manoeuvre Leonard to the ropes in an attempt to force the fight inside, Dundee shouted from the corner to Richard Steele, Watch that bull-headed sucker's head. In the corner after the tenth, Dundee told Leonard, Six minutes to the title. Man, you can do six minutes in your sleep, can't you? He's a miracle man doing what he's doing right now. And he's winning, in my opinion, said Clancy on the telecast, adding that Hagler needed to win each of the last two rounds to win the fight. In the 11th, Hagler nailed Leonard with a right jab and followed with a combination. Leonard responded with a flurry of his own, took a step backwards and then lashed out to catch Hagler with a right-hand lead. For the first time all night, he seemed to be getting the better of the infighting, even when he was backed up against the ropes. As the 12th and final round commenced, Dundee dispatched Leonard from his corner with a shout of three minutes champ. As he rolled from his stool, Leonard held his gloves above his head in an unmistakable gesture of confidence. Hagler sneered and mocked him by raising his own gloves. Once again, Hagler dutifully stalked his quarry and once again, Leonard avoided any serious engagement. In those final minutes, an expression of scorn etched on his face. Hagler seemed to be talking to Leonard. He was, referee Richard Steele would later confirm. 
but still added there were words I would not repeat. Richard Steele's other occupation in life was an ordained minister. Well into that stanza, Sugar Ray actually looked to his corner and shouted, How much time? One minute, Ollie shouted back. And with that, Leonard raised his right glove in triumph as he danced away. Hagler snarling and huffing in pursuit, disdainfully raised his own glove. At the final bell, Leonard attempted the same celebratory backflip he had enacted in the Superdome ring once he realized the round had quit. This time he miscalculated and landed flat on his back. He had to be carried back to his corner. Even as he was being toweled off awaiting the verdict, Leonard swears that he looked out into the audience and already saw money changing hands. What that meant was that in the eyes of some people, I'd won just because I was still there at the end, recalled Leonard. From the third round on, I'd been looking out in the audience and I could tell from the expression on some people's faces they were saying, shit, he's still there. An amazing number of people didn't think I would be. Clancy, on the closed circuit telecast, described Leonard's as the greatest performance I'd seen by any boxer and still pronounced it the greatest fight I've ever been involved in. In the moments between the conclusion of the fight and the announcement of the decision, there had been a near fist fight between two old rivals Don King had not been involved in the promotion. His allegiance was clear-cut. Hagler was Bob Aaron's fighter, and Leonard was not. And sensing the possibility of an upset, King had begun to climb the steps into Leonard's corner to join in the celebration. <laughs> See, I don't know about all this. <laughs> Aaron behind him tried to pull King back down the steps but succeeded only in ripping the pockets of King's expensive sports coat. The rival promoters squared off, but were quickly separated by a Caesar's security guard, who restrained King and then began to pull him away. King turned on the peacemaker, calling him a lousy black motherfucker, but he never did make it into the ring. The man had nothing to do with the fight, fumed Aram, who got high marks from the ringsiders for his display of bravery, but refused to gloat. I'm not going to drop in any way, shape or fashion to that guy's level, said Aaron. The writers at ringside that night were as divided as the judges turned out to be. Scoring for the Associated Press, Shula had Hagler winning 117-112. Someone else from the press had Leonard narrowly ahead. Since the newspapers used the Associated Presses round by round for the press run that hit the streets immediately after the fight, Readers who picked up the Herald Bulldog edition must have been bewildered to read side-by-side -side accounts of a fight with two different winners. As they await the decision, Hagler appeared concerned that it had come to this. He hadn't wanted to leave it in the hands of the judges. Leonard, on the other hand, seemed positively serene. I thought I'd won the fight, but I didn't really care that much, one way or the other, Leonard said. I proved something to myself. It was exciting. And the anticipation on people's faces right there told me that whatever the judges said, it had lived up to their expectations. Filippo scored the fight 115, 113 or 7-5 in rounds for Hagler. Moretti had the same score, but in Lennon's favour. The third judge, Guerrero, had it 118-110 for Leonard. A massive 10-2 margin. So utterly at variance with reality that Pat Petronelli would proclaim that Jojo Guerrero is a disgrace. He ought to be put in jail. Ask Leonard if he thought Hagler won only two rounds. Angelo Dundee did not seem to disagree with this assessment. Unfortunately, Leonard's trainer would say the next morning, one of the judges wasn't with us last night. Ironically, of course, Guerrero had been impaneled only because Petronelli had demanded a Mexican judge. Harry Gibbs, who had flown back to England after being dismissed from the tribunal, watched the fight on television and scored it for Hagler. Ho, 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 no. So, the Hagler camp sent Harry Gibbs back to England and he scored the fight for Hagler. So, if he was there, whoo, Hagler would have retained his title. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. In mid-ring, Leonard approached a crestfallen Hagler. And as he attempted to embrace the ex-champion, he whispered, you are the champion to his ear. Hagler would claim that Leonard was admitting you won the fight. We're still friends, right? Asked Leonard. When Marvin didn't respond, Ray repeated the question. We're still friends. Hagler was still staring off into space. It's not fair. He finally murmured. 
Interviewed in the ring, Leonard proclaimed it's a special conflict. Marvin is still the middleweight champion of the world. It wasn't his belt I wanted, I just wanted to beat him. In his dressing room, Hagler was almost inconsolable. I beat him, murmured Hagler. I beat him and he knows it. I told you about Vegas, they stole it. I stayed aggressive and I won the fight. He told me himself, you beat me. I feel in my heart that I'm still the champ. Well over an hour elapsed before Hagler and his small entourage vacated the dressing room and began the long march back to the hotel. The crowd had long since dispersed to the gaming tables and elsewhere on the grounds a Leonard victory party was already underway. The arena, deserted but for the cleanup crew, in the parking lot outside, a beer truck was loading up the remaining inventory from the concession stands. As Hagler passed by, he called to one of those workers, Hey man, how about a six pack? The following loading truck didn't even hesitate. You are the champ, Marvin, he said, and handed over two cases of Budweiser for Hagler to take back to his suite. Six years, six months, and then ten days after it had begun, on a rainy night in London, Marvin Hagler's championship reign had come to an end. The decision was immediately controversial. Two decades later, the debate had scarcely abated. After filing our post-fight stories, a dozen scribes reconvened in the bar at the Flame Steakhouse late that night, and a lively discourse ensued. Even Hagler's corner seemed to have been retrospective. Marvin should have come out stronger, conceded Pat Petronelli. That was a mistake but the fight should have been 15 rounds. Leonard was out on his feet at the end, exhausted. A championship fight should be 15 rounds, but Leonard's people wouldn't do it. I beat him, and you know it, moaned Hagler. How can they take the title from the champion on a split decision when the other guy won't fight? A split decision, he insisted, should go to the champion. The morning after the fight, Leonard was having breakfast in the Cafe Roma at Caesars when he was joined by John Madden, Madden was a big fight fan, said Leonard. He had been at the gym the day Quincy Taylor had Leonard out on his feet, and he didn't think there was any way Leonard could win. The morning, he sat down across the table from Leonard and just stared, as if he couldn't believe what he was looking at. He looked at Leonard for about five minutes and never said a word. Then he got up and walked away. My heart really went out to Marvin, said Leonard. I honestly wish there was some way I could have beaten him and then said, here's your belt. That title meant the world to Marvin. It was his identification and he'd finally been getting the recognition he thought he should have. He started doing commercials. Where was he going to go now? I'm going to discourage him from fighting again, said Pat Petronelli. He doesn't need it. In Hagler's mind, a rematch would have been a logical conclusion to the conspiracy theory. I believe the boxing world wants me back, he said, and the only way they could keep me here was with a rematch. Under the circumstances, Aaron was reluctant to push Hagler towards a hasty decision. I don't know how things will work out, but it's a fight I'd like to see again, allowed the promoter. In the days following the fight, Leonard was not among those pressing for a rematch. On Monday night, he hinted at one direction in which he might go, but he was nodding towards Hearn's newly acquired light heavyweight title. I'll see you in six months and 15 pounds heavier from now. Ten days after the super fight, sportscaster... John Dennis of Boston's WNAC-TV reported that the Nevada State Athletic Commission was investigating a report that an unidentified gambler who had bet a large sum on Leonard had improperly influenced one of the judges to swing the fight to the challenger. I subsequently recapitulated the episode in the pages of Boxing Illustrated. As it turned out, an investigation was not underway but following the widespread circulation of John Dennis's story, Nevada officials were forced to initiate one. In order to avoid potential conflict of interest charges, Nevada Commissioner Dwayne Ford turned the matter over to a special investigator representing the State Attorney General's department. It did not require the services of Sherlock Holmes to discern the gambler in question was some fight manager named Billy Baxter, and that the judge whose ethics had been called into question was Guerrero, not Moretti. But after an investigation lasted several months, both men were completely exonerated. The appearance of impropriety stemmed from the fact that Baxter and Moretti had discussed going into business together in a planned gymnasium in Las Vegas. Although it was never conclusively determined who had leaked the fixed story to Dennis, 
Leonard's people suspected that it had been someone in the Hagler camp, or perhaps Aram himself. The episode did not exactly smooth the way for a rematch. What gets me, Mike Craner said at the time, is that Ray never uttered a peep after he lost the first fight to Duran, one that in our minds was equally disputable. All his belly aching, all his complaining, all these excuses, it made, it made Ray very disappointed in Marvin. He hadn't been a very good sport about the whole thing. The combatants would continue to exchange recriminations in the weeks following the fight. He called me a sissy, complained Leonard. Months later, Hagler was back in Vegas doing the color commentary for a middleweight title fight between Sumbu Kalambe and Iron Barkley. After he partied at a nightclub called Botany's, where he had a chance encounter with Leonard in the men's room. Some fight, huh? said Leonard, attempting to make small talk. All he got was an icy stare from Hagler in return. Hagler walked away. It was clear that there would be no rematch. Ollie Dunlap suggested that Hagler simply emerged from the super fight saying, well, I thought I won, but I guess the judges saw it differently. Let's do it again. Ray might have said, sure. As it was, said Dunlap, Everything Hagler and his people did over the next several months only soured Ray on the idea of fighting again, or at least fighting Marvin again. But this whole sour grapes attitude they've had since the moment they stepped out of the ring is not going to have its desired effect. The last thing they should have been doing was running around telling people they got robbed and the fight was fixed and all that bullshit. Leonard convened another press conference, this time in Washington, to announce that he was relinquishing the WBC middleweight championship and that for the fourth time if you include his post Olympic announcement he was retiring from the ring why should we believe you this time he was asked you're retired now but will you ever fight again no Ray replied but then broke into a grin but you guys know me even in retirement though Leonard left the door open for a possible rematch with Hagler that ought to me told a Washington television interviewer, if Hagler wants to fight me, he has to come to me and talk about it first. A few weeks later, Leonard appeared on the Oprah Winfrey show in Chicago, where he told Oprah, Hagler never gave me credit. I beat Hagler, fair and square. He made the allegation that some officials in Nevada were corrupt. I think he's unprofessional, and I want to beat him up. Hagler refused to rise to the bait. Let Leonard go get another belt, he said. If he really wanted to fight again, why did he give up the title? All Marvin has to do is call me up, said Ray. If I do call him, grumbled Hagler, it to Hagler, it will be collect. A myth has grown up that Hagler wanted a rematch and I wouldn't give it to him, Leonard reflected years later. That's bullshit. I knew the value of a rematch and having beaten Marvin once, I felt I could beat him again even easier the second time around. But as you know, Marvin is stubborn. When he says no, he means no, and he won't change his mind no matter what. In the aftermath of the fight, Hagler decided to take a long family vacation. He bought a van that would accommodate the entire brood and asked Angie Carlino to come along as his driver. Marvin and Bertha had been having trouble in their marriage even before the Leonard fight, said Carlino. Part of the reason for the trip was that he was hoping to patch things up with her. They spent nearly two months driving across the country and back with the kids in tow from New England out to the West Coast and then back again. Marvin tried to be as incognito as someone who was recognizable as himself could be. He wanted to get away from everything. Bob Aaron was phoning him relentlessly. Marvin wouldn't pick up. There was talks of Marvin fighting Davy Hilton, one of the Hilton brothers who made a little noise in the 80s. Would have been a big fight in Montreal. But Marvin said, I don't know if I'm going to fight again. A few weeks later, after the road trip, Bertha Hagler filed for divorce. Hingham District Court on the 30th of June, 1987. Shortly thereafter, she retained the services of a noted Los Angeles celebrity attorney, thereby cementing yet another bond amongst three of the four kings. Between divorce and custody proceedings, Hagler, Leonard and Hearns shared another common opponent besides the Ram across a negotiating table. The three of them all went eyeball to eyeball with Marvin Mitchelson. Hagler eventually packed up his bags and moved to Europe and never fought again.